Or am I? Good morning. I'm Judith Lay and this is Praise, the programme that connects faith and daily life. Radio. On the programme today, a local Methodist minister will be ordained in Birmingham later today. We hear about his journey to this point and find out how you can share in this special celebration. And the Flower Festival starts today. The cathedral is one of 18 venues across the island and they're interpreting this year's theme through a new exhibition. Curator Rosemary Clark will be along shortly to tell us more about it. But first, some music, in recognition that this is Armed Forces Day and will be marked by a whole series of events in Douglas today to recall with gratitude all those who gave so much for our freedom and to acknowledge all our armed forces whose task it is to preserve the peace that we enjoy. Let's begin with a hymn that features often in parades and acts of remembrance. O oh God, our help in ages past. The St. Michael Singers with a fine accompaniment to a much-loved hymn. Reverend Andy Fishburn has, for the last two years, taken care of the Methodist churches in the west of the island. So when I discovered that he was about to be ordained, I have to admit I was confused. Andy's ordination will take place in Birmingham later today. But before he left the island for his pre-ordination retreat, he very kindly spared me some time for a chat. So, first of all, I asked him to explain why he's being ordained when it seems as if he's a fully-fledged minister already. Well, in Methodism we do things slightly differently than some of the other denominations. In a way, I've been doing the job for two years now. One way of thinking about it is that the Methodist Church want to make sure. So they make you do two years of what's called probation where you you do the job, you do everything that an ordained minister would. And I guess there's a chance that if it doesn't work out, you could, from either side, they could pull the plug. So it's a real chance for for me to find out whether this is the right thing, but also for the church to decide whether it's the right thing. In in Methodism, effectively, the church is making a a contract, a two-way contract with me. When, When they ordain, when they receive into full connection, what that means is the church is committing to look after me for the rest of my life. Um, to provide me with a little bit of income so I don't have to work 
provide a house and and all these things and that's regardless of performance or what I do so it's an amazing gift that they're offering and in return I I offer to be sent wherever they want me to go to do the job of ministry so it's a lifetime commitment on both sides so it's not something to be taken lightly so I understand why they want to take a bit of time to to make sure. The way this actually works is that here on the island you had a testimony service in the Methodist Church in Peel and then you will go to Methodist Conference which is a a huge gathering of of the the Methodist Church in Mm -hmm. in general where the island will be heavily represented and then as part of that you will have your ordination service. Is that that right? Yes, pretty much. Yes, on the the, the Methodist Conference is something that happens every year and it's where we make all of our major decisions. So at the, the first act of worship on the first Sunday it's an old phrase, comes from John Wesley's time, I'll be received into full connection. So that means that we have this covenant promise between me and the church. And all of the, the people who are my peers will be received into full connection at the same time. The Methodist Conference, it is a huge gathering. And uh, as Methodists, we're very clear that we're all connected to each other. We're, it's called the Methodist Connection, the network of ministers and local preachers and lay people in the church we're all part of one big church this is where we do get together and then after that service is finished at lunchtime we all then disperse to several different venues locally for our ordination service so the reception to full connection is almost like the church finally saying yes we we're prepared for you to be ordained but there's no one building big enough to fit all of the people who would like to come to the ordination service for all of the people. So we have to disperse into, I think it's about five or six different venues this time. Well, that's lovely, isn't it? That there are so many people who want to share yes. this moment with you. So yes. that, that's going to be very special indeed. Andy, I'd like to talk, if I may, just a little bit about the journey that has brought you here because you're a man of mm. many gifts. You're a qualified teacher and a very gifted artist. You're very creative and original in the way that you think. It would seem to me that you're gifted for lots of things. So why God? Well, it's, it's, it's tricky to put into words, really. When, when I was a teacher, I used to teach physics. And I had a real sense that I wanted to introduce children to the the wonders of the universe and to to make it as clear as I can to get rid of the stuff that's built up around the subject. When I say that I'm a physics teacher, lots of people's eyes glaze over because they have bad memories of their own physics education at school. And it can be very dry and it can be very dull. So I, I very much took it upon myself to try and make it as vital and as real and as as meaningful as it could be. And the same applies to to God, really. I love the fact that I now have the ability to speak for God in a way, which is an, a, cr- a crazy thing to, to say. But I, you know, I've got the job where I have the, the status and the position to preach God's word and bring Jesus alive to the people I, I meet and to, to do actions like Holy Communion and baptisms, funerals, all of these things these actions where it's as if God was there and I somehow have the ability to do that and that's such an amazing thing so what what else would you want what else would I want to do really God is the the reason for all of this so I've got a chance to to try my best to try and bring him to life but certainly within the Methodist church you could have gone on being a teacher you could have been a local preacher you could have have had the two careers Mm. What, what was it that made you think no it's got to be all for God was there a watershed moment there was a watershed moment it was a it's an unusual one perhaps but when I look back I can see that the signs were there and it was a a slowly building thing over the long time but I was quite obtuse to that and I didn't manage to notice or pay attention to it you know I, I very much thought that yes I would be a teacher all my life but I would I'll be a local preacher and do other things within the life of the church separately but without doing it full time effectively but we had a a funny situation that my wife Susie had a a real sense that God was calling her to full-time ministry and she went quite a long way down the the way of exploring this she worked as a lay worker for a while in the church and trained as a local preacher but it just didn't quite fit but then one evening she had a really clear revelation where she really felt God saying that actually it's not you it's him I wanted you to know that you were worthy of the calling as well and you were the one called first but actually it, it's him so she came and told me told me this that it's you you're the one who's got to go and become a full-time minister and I, I sort of sat up straight and thought what <laughs> I'm a teacher so then it, it sent me on a quite long process of thinking actually is this right is this what God wants Has, have there been any sort of signs of calling before this 
One of the things I've been learning over these last two years is to be bold and speak out those little hunches that I have. If I think that someone is good for a particular role in the church, then in a way it's my job to to speak up and to voice that and to take the initiative to pray for people and and all those sort of things, which part of me thinks, oh, you know, I'll, I'll just keep that quiet. But actually, no, it is my job to speak out, actually, because this may be the way that God wants to speak to people. One of Graham Kendrick's worship songs, Jesus Stand Among Us, that will be sung at the main Methodist conference service later this morning, alongside more traditional hymns from Charles Wesley. It's a mix that Andy believes is very important, and so a balance between new music and well-known hymns is something he works hard to achieve in the new service, called Faren, that he started a year ago in Peel Methodist Church, as Andy now explains. I've always been interested in different styles of worship and I've always played guitar and led worship in a more modern style than some of our churches are used to. We've always had worship like that in the churches I've been in in the past. And it was clear that there weren't many opportunities for that over here within the Methodist church. And there were lots of people who seemed to want it. So we we just thought, well, let's have a try. So we, we started a service in early evening, late afternoon. We have a band and it's, it's quite flexible and informal and it's, it seems to have gone really well. And we're really pleased that the people have got involved and felt a freshness of God. The name itself says what you're trying to, to convey in the service, doesn't it? What does the word mean? Yeah, well, again, this is my highly prophetic wife who is to thank for, for that. She woke up one morning and said, you need to look up what the Manx word for spring is. Spring as in wellspring, sort of bubbling up water because that's what God wants it to be called. So I typed into the computer, (laughs) I found a Manx dictionary, and it came up as Feren. And I thought, well, that's a nice name, that will do. So that's why we called it that. I asked someone how to pronounce it for one thing, and they they pointed out that if you drop the F off the front of it, it makes a Ren, which means song or singing. So it works on that level as well. So it's about freshness and God's goodness bubbling up in a fresh flowing way. When you publicise it, you will often put links to a YouTube channel where people can listen to the music in advance. Mm. It's an idea I've I pinched from a Methodist church called New Song, which is in Warrington. It's, it was to introduce new songs, so they they published a list of the songs beforehand so people could listen and, and learn them a little bit beforehand. And it's so easy to do, it doesn't take long, so why not? I started off in a church where it was all sort of guitar and band led and I remember once discovering that actually the the music for hymns is the same it was a it's an obvious thing to people who are musical but it was a eye-opener for me that actually the hymns are just the same it's the same notes it's the same chords you can play them on a guitar and it's fine so yes why not you can do hymns on guitar you can do modern songs so we try to get a blend it's not fun when you go to a service and you don't know any of the songs I've been to many of those in my time so if we can try and make it a little bit familiar for people then all the better.
I don't really know what the ordination will be like. I'll be prayed for that the Spirit will anoint me and equip me for the job of being a minister. Um, so who knows, with that power behind what will happen, I don't know. A wonderfully positive final thought there from Reverend Andy Fishburn, who will be received into full connection with the Methodist Church later this morning. And you can watch that happening and share in the whole of the service too, because it's going to be live streamed. And all you need to do is to go to Trinity Methodist Church at Rosemount here in Douglas, where they're hosting a united time of worship this morning so that anyone who wishes can watch the live streamed service. The service actually starts at a quarter to 11 and includes a sermon preached by the new president of conference, Reverend Barbara Glasson, who will be visiting the island in May next year. This is a great chance to share a joyous celebration of all that it means to be part of a worldwide church. The live stream actually starts at a quarter past 10 with half an hour of music from the conference centre. And if you're going to watch the live stream, you're asked to be in Trinity at Rosemount and seated by 20 minutes to 11. Wallingford Parish Church Choir and Be Thou My Vision. Today is the opening day of the Isle of Man Flower Festival and 18 venues around the island, mostly churches and chapels, will be open daily from 11am to 5pm with wonderful floral displays created around this year's theme, which is Working Together. The cathedral in Peel is taking part and the dean, the very Reverend Nigel Godfrey, has found an imaginative way to link their floral displays to a major new exhibition in the cathedral, curated by Rosemary Clark, a member of the cathedral's ministry team who joins me now to tell us more. Well, you know that the theme this year is working together and back in the autumn somebody mentioned to me that this year we're celebrating 200 years of having a Bible in Manx that the general public could buy. And so we thought, wouldn't that be interesting to explore about the development of that Bible, how we come to have it, but also its role in preserving the Manx language because it's the biggest text in Manx. And so it's quite important from that point of view. So what have you discovered whilst you were putting this together? Well, you know, I hadn't really thought about the fact that until about 1610, there were no Manx people who were literate unless they knew English or Latin, I suppose, because the Manx language had never been written down and most people only spoke Manx. And so it was the very beginning of one of the bishops who thought, 
you know, we really ought to have scriptures and the prayer book and other things that were in the Manx language, which people understand, rather than the ministers thinking, oh dear, I suppose I'd better offer my own translation from the English version. He was a Welsh speaker, and so he learned Manx. And because there was a Welsh Bible and things in Welsh, he wanted to do the same for the Isle of Man. The main project he worked on was the prayer book. But in fact, it wasn't actually published, I think, for more than 100 years. So the manuscript was there, but for all sorts of reasons, it didn't actually get printed. So it's fascinating history. Well, of course, printing was not that easy to do, was it? And certainly not on the island. No, um, part of the Bible was the first thing to be printed on the island. But that's another thing. There's this lovely story that somebody went across to Whitehaven with an important manuscript to get it printed, and the, the boat he was on was shipwrecked. And so there's this story of him holding it above his head until he was rescued. Now, the annals suggest that was for five hours, Now, I don't know in our seas how anybody could manage to survive that long and holding this uh, book above their heads, but it's a lovely story. Well, it is, and if the ship was wrecked, that's the only way that he could have preserved it, somehow keeping it out of the water. So then we move on to the Bible. Did they do it in in sections? Yes. Well, the Psalms were translated first because, of course, they're part of the Book of Common Prayer. So they're probably the bit that's been published most over the years. But the next thing was the Gospel of Matthew. And it's reputed that this was done in prison because Bishop Wilson and his two vicars general were imprisoned because of some dispute with the civil authorities. And while they were there, they thought, oh, why don't we translate Matthew's Gospel? And so that was the first bit. And then over subsequent years, different bits were done by different people. And Bishop Hildersley, who I'd never heard of until I began this project, he recruited the various vicars on the island to do several books each. And so at the front of the Bible that was produced to mark the millennium of the Manx government, in 1979 you've got a list of these translators and so we've got a picture of that as part of the exhibition. Was it popular? Was it well received? What happened once it was done? Well that's really interesting because there was a real drive to get it done because there was a real feel of need and to begin with it was certainly welcomed but it almost came too late because although the Bible was responsible for the revival of the language it was also a contributory fact towards its demise because the church was very keen on education and they wanted it to be in English because they felt that would be the most useful. And so you've got this picture of them translating the Bible, but at the same time trying to get people educated in English. So that um, after not very long, they were remaindering copies of the Bible and selling it at half price for three shillings and it still wasn't going. So, yeah, mixed reception. Yes, they wanted people to be educated in a universal language. Presumably, Manx speaking was just going on in an oral tradition. But it was dwindling. We know about Ned Madrill being the last Manx speaker, so he features in the exhibition as well. And one of the things we thought was... Um, we would actually make this work with the Flower Festival. So the exhibition about the Bible will carry on all through the summer, but the first week with the flowers, it will be very special because we've done a, a series of exhibition boards and each one will be interpreted by flowers. And so there's been a, a huge feeling of working together So Nigel is very good at kind of knowing the cathedral and how it works. And he's also a very visual person. So his work with the flower arrangers and with myself to see how this can work together. So that's one lot of working together. Then Culture Vanin have been supporting the exhibition by paying for the boards. Manx National Heritage have been helping with all of the research and questions about the pictures. And then somebody said to me, well, look, if this is an exhibition about the Manx language, it ought to be in Manx, you know, as well as English. So, yeah, it's been a challenging and exciting project to be part of. You're still smiling. You enjoy meeting a challenge, don't you, Rosemary? Well, I do. And, um, yeah, I had no idea I'd be up for this one. But, yeah, it's been really very interesting indeed. And and I think a very important story that needs to be told. Now, to complement it still further, you've got a wonderful Manx choir coming to sing at the cathedral this evening, haven't you? Kirjin Kuja, conducted by the present Manx bard, Annie Kizak, will be in the cathedral tonight, won't they? 
Yes, they certainly will. The bishop is going to be hosting that event. So there will be singing and there will also be some readings. And the choir is putting together a programme that reflects the theme of the whole exhibition. For example, there are many renderings of Psalm 23, The Lord is My Shepherd. And I think they'll be doing one of those in Manx. And they'll also be having some readings, not necessarily all from the Bible, but a mixture of speech and song. I think it will be a lovely event. In the cathedral tonight, and do we have a starting time for Yes, it? it's at 7.30. Absolutely free, and there will be light refreshments afterwards. Rosemary Clark, thank you very much indeed for talking to me. Thank you, Judith. And if you're visiting that exhibition, do be sure to allow some extra time to explore the cathedral gardens. They're looking beautiful and full of interest. Many flower festival churches have special craft displays, concerts and other attractions in addition to the flowers. I'll be talking much more about them all on sundown tonight. There's also a very informative website, flowerfest.im, and you can search for Isle of Man Flower Festival on Facebook for up-to-the-minute posts and pictures. And that's all we've time for this week. Don't forget to take a look at the Praise blog, the home of our church notice board. It's also got details of everything that we've talked about on today's programme. Just go to manxradio.com, on the homepage, click on air, and on the drop-down menu, follow the link for blogs. Thank you for listening to this week's Praise Podcast. There's a new Praise Podcast available every Sunday morning. You can subscribe for free at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts and Spotify via the Manx Radio smartphone app or at manxradio.com. So, till we meet again, this is Judith saying thank you for your company and I wish you and those you love every blessing in the days ahead. Music.